just amplify on Johnny's comments a little bit. Um, I'm not an expert in catastrophe planning. That's Jesse's world, and so he's going to give you the specifics about how you do that. I want to talk a, a little bit today about growth. So the first statement is growth happens, <laughs> and we have met the enemy and they are us. Two-thirds of growth in Utah is natural increase. It's our kids and our grandkids. So as you're thinking about managing the facilities in your counties, you're going to have growth, mostly. There may be a few counties that don't have any growth, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you should assume you're going to have growth. You're going to have to have more buildings, more facilities, more infrastructure. It's going to, the people who are here are not going to be the same people who are here now. We know that the diversity is increasing in Utah. We're going to have a lot more diverse populations. Water and air are limiting factors. And so when you manage your buildings and your facilities, working towards protecting the air quality and finding ways to be frugal with water use are going to be important. The question for all of us who are in public service is, how do we provide the services, the water, the sewer, the police, the fire, the buildings, etc., for twice as many Utahns in 30 years without destroying our environment and our quality of life? So I'm going to talk a little bit about growth and some of those questions, but those are difficult questions to answer. This is a little bit about the past, the present, and the future. Much of what we have is aging and, and in need of repair, and I don't need to tell you that, but just a couple of examples. <coughs> Recent estimates are that there are as many as 200,000 unreinforced masonry buildings along the Wasatch Front. Most of those are homes. Unreinforced masonry doesn't perform well in an earthquake. So there are 200,000 potential death traps along the Wasatch Front if we ever have that big one that, that is being predicted. Interestingly enough, even our infrastructure is aging. Salt Lake City Public Utilities still has wooden water pipes in the ground in some parts of the city that are still functioning and so they're still using it. But those eventually are going to have to be replaced. Yeah. Question is, as our population increases, increases the road miles, height sections, feet of power line, number of buildings, all of that is going to have to increase. So the question is, how do we fix what we have inherited? How do we build what we need now? And how do we plan for the future? And we have to make it all safe, secure, and resilient. And that's a difficult task. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm not going to tell you how to plan for a catastrophe. I'm going to leave that to Jesse. Okay? I am going to talk about growth. How are we doing? What is our role in preserving our quality of life? And I'm going to encourage you to plan for the future. I'm going to tell you at the very end about a couple of resources that are out there and available to you that might be useful and help you to do some of this. And then I'm going to encourage us all to make everything safe, secure, and resilient again, as we've said. So, I've got two logos at the bottom, Envision Utah, which is a public-private partnership, Quality Growth Commission, which I represent, is a state agency. About 15 years ago, the quality growth strategy for the 10 counties around the Wasatch Front was, was uh, implemented. This was an, uh, an effort to try to identify where we were, think about where we wanted to go, and then track that over time. Originally, we were going to go to 2020, but we've seen such rapid growth and such rapid change in the last 15 years that we've decided to think about, uh, or we decided to, to start a new process so that by 2020, we'll have a new vision in place and a new strategy in place. And so I just want to show you some of the things that we've learned from that process over the 15 years. And remember, this is mostly in the Salt Lake City metro region, the 10 counties around it. The new effort that we're engaged in at the insistence of the state is going to be a statewide effort. So we're going to be looking everywhere for the same kinds of information. So the 10 county population was 1.7 million people in 1998. In this, in 2013, it was 2.3 million. By 2020, we estimate that that 10 county uh, population will be 2007. Just to give you, and I left an S off of that. I apologize for those who were correcting my spelling. I'll acknowledge that I, I missed an S on that an analysis. Uh, this is interesting. The, the, the growth strategy 
has had some effect on how we grow. So the black line there shows that the pre-strategy, the trend was that from 1997 to 2020, we would consume a total of about 695 square miles in that 10 county region that would be developed. As a result of the things that we've done with the growth strategy, in 2013, we're at 459, and we expect to only go to 494. What that means is that about 200 square miles of land that might otherwise have been consumed by 2020 will not because of the things that we did. But what was the factor that caused that? We think there are lots of factors. A recession, two recessions, you know, changes in the economy, etc. But one of the most interesting ones is this. The size of the lots for houses in, in that 10 county region has gone down from 0.32 acres in 1997 to 0.25 acres in uh, 2013. That means that it takes less water to water the grass, takes less road miles that have to be uh, maintained and managed. Um, it takes a variety of things that have, you know, so as we've grown, we've shrunk some of those, uh, the size of things. But that does change a person's lifestyle. And it makes preserving parks and open space and some of those things where people might want to go and recreate more important if their backyards are a little smaller. So uh, an interesting set of challenges and trade-offs in every planning decision that you make. Water consumption, this is the most interesting one. And this also has to do with the lot sizes going down. 1998, we were using 319 gallons per person per day in Utah. The strategy was we were going to get that down to 279 gallons per day. But in 2013, we were actually 40 points below that. We're down to 240, 240 gallons per day, 25% reduction. So all of you are thinking about saving water. This is the same kind of thing we've got to do if we're going to meet our growth challenges as we, as we continue to grow. And that's why I'm telling you about growth. Growth is important for everybody as citizens, but particularly for those of us in public service, we've got to continue providing these services with relatively small budgets. And so finding ways to save water is going to be a positive thing. Transportation, vehicle miles of travel. 1998. The average person traveled 25.1 miles per day. That was the estimate. And the, the, quite the estimate was that by 2020 that would increase. But actually in 2013 we've gone down one mile. Again, that's largely gasoline prices, recessions, etc. And that's starting to turn around again. But it's, an, it's interesting to see how those things impact the uses of of vehicles and other things, and as you're thinking about the facilities, all of these kinds of things are going to have impacts on what you do. Are you in a recession? Are you in a, you know, an economy that's providing you a lot more money than you might otherwise have had? Are you using your, your facilities and your uh, resources efficiently and effectively over time as we grow? Also, another part of that is that we have 150,000 bus boardings a day, transit boardings a day in that 10 county region, and that replaced 110,000 cars that were on the road. Yes? Did you have a goal for that? Uh, we did. I don't have it on this slide, but I think it, it was actually higher than that. And the assumption was we were going to do more than that. Uh, but this is quite, you know, it's, it's had an effect. But, um, we have, uh, and there's another slide we're coming to here that will talk a little bit more about that and I'll show you that. Then. This is the one I was going to show you. So this shows you what we've done with regard to transit in that, in that region. 140 miles of rail have been added. And I should tell you that that's more than any place in the country. More than New York, more than Chicago, more than Los Angeles, more than Philadelphia, you name the city. Nobody's built that many miles of rail in the last 15 years. And to our credit, we built all of that under budget and quicker than we anticipated we would build it. The last 
the Draper line, which opened last year, wasn't scheduled to be open until the end of 2015. And that was the last one we built. Now there's uh, the airport line was supposed to open this year, and it opened last year. So we tend to be quite good at building rail, building it in inexpensively, and building it quicker than we anticipated we would do it. But our strategy said we should have 700,000 people living within half mile of the rail stop. In 2013, it's only 195,000. So that's largely because while we've made some changes to the way uh, people have begun to think about living differently, I think in, in 2000 or 1997, we anticipated a lot more growth in high-rise apartments and that sort of thing right next to rail stops. And while some of that has happened, it hasn't happened as quickly. And we've come to understand that we're probably not going to get there. The people really do like to have individual homes, and so we see the lot sizes being shrunk down because people can't afford the big, you know, the cost of, of big lots, but we're not seeing as many apartments being built, so we have to figure out how to, as we re, reconfigure this strategy going forward, we have to figure out what impacts that's going to have on transit and a variety of other things. Mostly I'm giving you this information just to show you that where we are and what's happening. This is an interesting one, too. We always talk a lot about air quality. But the interesting part here is that in 2002, in the 10 county region, we were releasing 409,000 tons of criteria pollutants. That's the six pollutants that the EPA tracks per year into the airship. By 2013, that had gone down to 217,500 tons. So we've cut that the emissions already in half, or nearly in half. We still have a long way to go, and people still don't like to live here sometimes when it's in the summertime and we have bad air. And sometimes we think about how terrible our air quality is. But we have a lot to be proud of with regard to what we've done to improve air quality over the last 15 years. This is one I think is really important for all of us in public service. This was an interesting study that was done by a man named Manuel Pastor at the University of Southern California. He was looking at growth and whether or not growth in communities really did float all boats. And Utah was basically the only place in the country where it did. Earnings went up in every sector, both the high wage, the medium wage, the low wage. And they actually went up more in the low wage and the medium wage than they did in the high wage. And the same is true for the number of jobs. And he indicated that he didn't know what it was and he's doing additional research, but that we need to try to work in, on retaining that. That's something that we in the public sector can be proud of, but we need to try to keep that up to make sure that we're helping people in all stratas of society as we grow and that we're not letting growth become something that benefits only a small group of people in our community. So, this is a statewide number. The last one was a 10 county number. So in 1998, statewide, our population was 2.1. Now it's about 2.9. The 10 county number that we saw before left out some of the regions that you represent. It didn't talk about Washington County didn't talk about Cache County, didn't talk about Iron County. So that's where that extra population comes from. We're estimating in the governor's office in 30 years' time, well, <coughs> a little more than 30 years' time, 35 years, that the population will double, the 5.4 million. So the real key for us then is what all of us is, what do we do to maintain the level of service and the level of of uh, a quality of life that we have and still take care of twice as many people. And that's the challenge going forward. And then we also have to think about what happens when there's a wildfire, what happens when there's an earthquake, what happens when there's a flood. Uh, you know, we all, we all understand that all of that other stuff changes if we have a natural disaster or, or some God forbid, some terrorist attack or whatever. Interestingly enough, this is what the population will look like. 
A lot more people of color, a lot more people of mixed race. Based on the best product projection from the University of Utah, they're telling us that diversity will escalate significantly in the next 35 years. So the people that we serve in public service now are not going to be the same people that will be served by the public servants in 2035. They're going to be our kids and our grandkids, but we're seeing a lot more mixed race couples, a lot more people coming in who are from other other uh, countries who are immigrants of various types, and their children are going to be here. And so it's going to be a very different state than we have now. So the, the current effort is called Your Utah, Your Future. And there are going to be a lot of opportunities for people to participate. We, of course, want to hear from public servants of all kinds. And so hopefully you'll participate and hear about those and get that information to you. So just to give you a sense, I've talked a little bit about it. You've seen the statistics. But I find that the picture's worth a thousand words. This is one of the resources that I would we talked about selling the need for more infrastructure, more buildings, etc. The picture is worth a thousand words. So this is virtual Utah. It's a project of Utah State University's Earth GIS lab. What they did was they took satellite photographs of Utah from the 1970s, the 1990s, and the 2000s, and they superimposed them over each other so that you can look at and you go in and draw a box and look at any part of your community and see visually the changes. So let me give you some examples. This is what Harriman looked like in the mid-1990s. And that's Harriman today. Or that's 2006. This is 10 years later. You can see the change in just 10 years. So anyone from Washington County here? Okay, so here's Washington. The next several will be Washington County. So this is north, north, east St. George in the mid 1990s. That's northeast St. George in 2006. This is Santa Clara in the mid 1990s. Ten years later, 2006. Ivans. Ten years later. Begin to actually see the impact of growth on the ground using this tool. Anybody from Box Elder County here? Okay, so here's Perry. And all the little black dots you see, right up here, and all along in here, those are orchards. Were orchards. They were, that's exactly right. <laughs> now the, 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 these streets all bear the names of the fruits that used to grow there. But there aren't many trees remaining. Okay? This is Orangeville. Now this one, I don't know if we got any Emory County people there. Okay. This is included in here to demonstrate that not every community grew and that there might be different sets of challenges in some counties. So this is Orangeville in 1990. That's Orangeville in 2006. Not a major change. Okay. So virtual Utah is one of those that can help you as you do some of that work if that's something you want. So you have a question? All right, so one of the conclusions we draw from that, Utah's a great place. Our quality of life is unsurpassed. Our future looks bright. We have challenges. Facilities managers affect all of Utah should care about the communities that you serve now and in the future. And then let me personally thank you for the, the work that you do in the counties and the communities that you serve this time. I know, as a public servant, that we all work hard and we all do important jobs that, we, that are often unsung. So I'm going to give you a computer of that. So what are the tasks that we have? Again, we have to maintain what we've inherited. Much of it is old and in need of replacement. Resources will continue to be scarce. We don't live in a state where we believe in increasing taxes every year. Okay? So we're not going to have uh, huge amounts of resources. We've got to figure out how to do more with less. We have to build what we need now. We have to provide the critical services, and we have to save and protect the lives and livelihoods of our citizens. And we have to plan for the future, including new technologies. A big future equals big challenges. 
We need to be prepared for catastrophe. We need to be resilient, which equals ready to come back stronger than we were. Okay? And then I want you to remember that sometimes crap hits the fan. Okay? So, the wind blows, snow falls, rivers flood, things catch fire. Earthquakes, floods, and fires are rare, but deadly events that can disrupt all the progress we're making with regard to the growth. Planning is a key part of that, being prepared and understanding what the issues are and the course we have to take to recover. So, we must know where we want to go and how we want to get there. That's the purpose of planning for catastrophe. And this is what I call Alice in Planning Land. So, Cheshire Puss, said Alice, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice explained. You're sure to do that if you only walk long enough, said the cat. And that's true in every situation. Wherever, whichever direction we walk is the direction we're going to go. And so if we don't know where we want to go, don't know what the issues are, we're going to have some trouble. So here's a, a few uh, resources that I'd like to kind of give you a chance to maybe look at. These are available on, on our website, which is planning.utah.gov. We um, had a lot more resources on our website until recently, and when we changed uh, service uh, providers on our uh, on our system, some of the resources were lost, so we're in the process of reconstructing our, resource, our, our website. But this is, these are some of the ones that are there. So this 2000, oh, it's not going to let me go there directly. Okay. So we got this. Let me just go one more and then we'll, uh, we'll just go to that directly. The last slide is just my contact information, which I think you've got. What does that say? I'm trying to push OK, but I'm not very good sideways with this. Come on. Uh, maybe I got there. Okay, here we go. All right, good. So, this is the, this is five years earlier, but there's some really interesting uh, material in this report regarding regarding some of the things that we have talked about. There are sections on air quality. There are sections on land use, demographics, water. But there's one in particular that I like, and that's a land use section that has, um, that looks at county by county at land uh, based on, on the 2008 trends, that, that the, the kind of land that will be available and the use, the, the consumption of land. So you can look at uh, each county and decide if we can, this is where we want to go. So look, this is the statewide agricultural versus developed land in 2005. And then the estimate is by 2030 is about that much, but that also has this uh, as a county by county, that's part of the executive summary, if you get down to the land use section, there's actually a county by county chart on there. So here we are. This is the projected development. That shows county by county. This is the the 2005 numbers, how many acres were developed versus how many were in agriculture. Some of this might be useful in terms of as you're looking at your projections. That's why I, I suggested that that was a useful tool. This is not going to be quite as useful perhaps for
So this is the finding.utah.gov page. A um, couple of, if you go into resources, the ones I wanted you to look at were the Land Use Ordinance Library. This is a, we put together a section, oh, that's not the one. That's state land use plans. That might be interesting, but that's not the one. So land use library. This is a <coughs> collection of land use ordinances from local governments around the state by category. So if you want to look at infrastructure, you want to look at the variety of things what various other communities have done. Uh, the kind of thing that you could you could use some of that. You look at infrastructure and transportation, roads and construction standards. Water requirements, stormwater management, uh, that sort of thing. Oh. So you can look at there's the it shows you the condition of the culinary water system, for example, or irrigation systems. And then this is the actual ordinance. We found this is the piece that is most useful to planners and others because many people have to help rewrite their ordinances or whatever. And this gives you a place to start. Sometimes that's the hardest part. Uh, this one other one, and then I'll let you look at them. This is the Automated Geographic Reference Center, the state of Utah. This is the land use planning section of what they call MapServe. HERC has all of the geographic data that's been collected by the state is online at AGRC. That's Automated Geographic Reference Center. But this is a land use look viewer that has a whole bunch of things like where are canals and water pipes, where they have that information, where are buildings located, where's prime agricultural soil, so all just a whole bunch of layers of information about every community in Utah that's been collected by the state. And it's available for you to put in an address or put in Go in and draw circles on the map and write things to come up with geographic information about your communities that is already available that the taxpayers have paid for, so you're welcome to use that information. And that might be something that would be very useful for you as you do some of your planning. Then uh, I think I'll just take any questions if anyone has any and give Jesse some more time. The one other thing I would point out, there's a that the state has a couple of others and they're on there. One is the, um, the Seismic Safety Commission has written a pamphlet called Putting Down Roots in Earthquake Country. It's got a lot of information and that's available online and there's a link at the end of, of my presentation, which I think you have a paper there that will show you where that is. Um, and then there's also, of course, the Be Red Utah uh, site, which is a site that the lieutenant governor and the governor's offices have put together in conjunction with the Department of Public Safety to help everyone in Utah be prepared for disaster. And so since that's what you're here for, I'd refer you to that one as well. Any questions about anything we talked about? Any of the growth related issues? Yeah. I was wondering what happened with the result of the quake being the analysis of the government. Governor did last year what did that quake day and stuff to the results. Um, now tell me what it was again. We, we had a shakeout. Yeah. The shakeout. Oh, the great shakeout. Yes. Jesse will tell you about that. Okay. Uh -huh. He's uh, he's going to encourage you to participate in it again this year, and he's got that information. I don't have. I'm, I'm volunteering you for that, Jesse. I, I hope you have that information. I have it covered. Okay, so he'll talk about that. And another one was uh, um, when we have quakes in our buildings and stuff, they show effects afterwards. That's right. And, and some of the insurance. Insurance required to be right now. And this, this is probably more for a decent guys. What is covered afterward? The buildings settle after earthquakes. Sometimes it takes two or three years for it to actually settle. So you don't have all you don't have immediately all the information about right. what the damage is. And same with floods too. Yeah. Floods can have a residual effect if it carries on to the factory. It's 
it's important to know that and be watching for that if that, that damage is going to occur. Because you're right, I mean, lots of these kinds of disasters can have that impact. We don't ever know what the impact is going to be of a major wildfire until it's over. And, uh, you know, and, and the, the land cover changes. Anything else? Thank you for having me here, and I hope that some of the information I gave you was interesting and useful. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thanks,